A landlord in Connecticut is suing two tenants for refusing to pay rent during the eviction moratorium, and those tenants don't understand why the landlord just can't forgive the debt. I'm Tony, and this is Real Estate Investing in Landlord News. All right, so I have an interesting article for you today, and it's coming out of Connecticut. And I like the 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 publication that publishes these articles because they talk to the tenants, they talk to the landlord. It's a, a very unbiased article, and that's pretty rare. I mean, if you read anything from the large, like the New York Times or anything, they don't care anything about the landlord's point of view in any of these articles, okay? They only talk to the tenants. They assume all landlords are bad, and you know they're pushing their own agenda. Now, this article, yeah, they do talk to the tenants in this article, but they also talk to the landlord. And the landlord puts out a very good explanation of why she is suing these tenants for not paying their rent, okay? And why she is not forgiving it. Because it, it makes perfect sense that landlords will want to be paid the money that they're owed. Now, these tenants are like, hey, you know, and, and this is what I like to think of a situation like this, right? That basically you got a service for free and you didn't pay for it, right? And now you don't want to pay for it and you think it's wrong that the person who you took the service from is demanding their money. Well, you know what that's called? That's called stealing, okay? You stole the money from this landlord that, that you owe this person and now you're like, well, why don't you just forgive it? Well, the landlord doesn't like to be stolen from, and maybe you need to learn a lesson, okay? So before I get into the article, go ahead, hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Maybe leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think, okay? If you had a tenant who owed you a debt from within the pandemic, are you going to sue them? I'll tell you what, it really depends, okay? Some tenants you know you're not going to be able to get a penny from. And even in this story, I'm not sure that this landlord is going to get a dime from either of these tenants. But she's suing them anyway. And you know what? If she can get anything from them, maybe that's what they deserve for cheating her, okay? For stealing her money from her. So uh, this article is coming from the New Haven Independent. And it says, small claims spat reflects big changes, okay? <laughs> And like I said, I, I really like this article. You know, it's very detailed and they don't just look at it from the tenant's perspective. But let's get into the article and see what it says. Rising rents drove Honorio Ramirez and Francisco Mendez Perez out of their apartments on Huntington Street. A year and a half later, their erstwhile landlord is looking to collect a portion of the debts she claims they owe for months and months of rent-free living in a house she upgraded during the pandemic. That ongoing legal debate centers on 264 Huntington Street, a three-family house that sits across the street from Albertus Magnus College on a sloping tree-lined block connecting Prospect Hill and Newhallville. The company that owns that property, 264 Huntington LLC, which is controlled by a local landlord, state economic development official, and city zoning commissioner Alexandra Dom, is pursuing two small claims lawsuits in state court against its former tenants, seeking $5,000 from Ramirez and $3,845 from Mendez Perez. So the good thing about small claims court is a lot of the times you can go in there, you don't need a lawyer. You can, you know, file these claims against your tenants, you know, for the money that they owe you. And it doesn't cost you a lot of money out of pocket to file these claims. So especially if she has experience in doing this, it might be, you know, not that difficult for her to do and not that expensive. Now, the fact that she probably won't be able to collect any money from these tenants, you know, you, you have to balance out, you know, is it worth the effort or not? Now, I personally do think it is worth the effort sometimes. And part of it is, you know, you need to get out there and show these tenants, hey, there are consequences for your actions. You just can't get, about, get, get away with everything for free. OK, so may, maybe that's what she's trying to do here. The small claims lawsuit against Ramirez alleges that he failed to pay rent while he and his family lived in an apartment at 264 Huntington Street between April and November 2020. The lawsuit against Mendez Perez alleges that he failed to pay rent while he and his family lived in a different apartment at 264 Huntington Street between April and August 2020. 
Dom's company initially filed both small claims cases in late May of 2021. So yeah, her company filed these cases a year ago. I mean, it's May of 2022 right now. So she filed both of them in uh, a year ago. And it says that um, it was for rent owed between April and November for one uh, guy and uh, April and August for the other guy. So, you know, it, it took her a while to file the claims, but that doesn't mean that she still isn't owed that money. Okay, maybe they, she has a good reason for waiting that long. After nearly a year's worth of court delays, both cases are now scheduled to have their next remote hearings in state court on Wednesday afternoon. City land records show that Dom's company bought 264 Huntington Street for 350000 in February 2020. Her company also bought the adjacent three-family home at 270 Huntington Street for another 350000 at that same time. These two particular small claims lawsuits and their underlying landlord-tenant disputes reveal conflicts exacerbated by COVID's impacts on the court system and by rapidly rising home prices in New Haven's hot real estate market. They also show how the state's then-in-place eviction moratorium may have discouraged tenants from paying rent owed at a time when housing court was largely closed to landlords. They raise questions about how building improvement-induced rent increases may displace tenants from their longtime homes, even as they make property safer, cleaner, and more convenient to live in. See, and I, I like that last paragraph there, okay? So they're talking about, you know, one... You know, they, they are critical of the tenants, okay? They say, hey, maybe the state's eviction moratorium actually encouraged the tenants to not pay the rent, okay? The second thing they mention in there is that, hey, a property owner bought the property and was fixing it up and making it nicer. And, you know, even though they were making it nicer, it might displace somebody, okay? Because the tenant might not be able to afford the new higher rent. But if the landlord doesn't come in there and fix the place up, you're going to have a whole bunch of dilapidated properties all over town. So you have to balance, you know, everything, you know, yes, these people might not be able to live here anymore, but they can only afford to live there if it is an old dilapidated property. They can't afford to live there if it's nice and, you know, fixed up like this lady wanted to do to the place. So I don't blame her for doing what she did she just bought the property she has a higher cost basis than the previous landlord and she is fixing it up making the city nicer overall making the area nicer overall okay so you can't expect her to not want to raise the rents and if these tenants couldn't afford it which it sounds like they couldn't then you know you have to move on to somewhere where you can't afford okay you have to go somewhere else now the other issue, if they lost their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Well, they need to do something. They need to figure out something because this landlord just can't go without getting any sort of uh, payment forever. I mean, did they expect that they were going to be allowed to stay forever without paying rent? No, but it gets worse because, you know, basically these tenants, they cause their own situation, okay? Okay. They caused a lot of these problems and they might have been able to be allowed to stay for longer if they had, you know, just communicated with this landlord. But let me get into this uh, next few paragraphs here. On the one hand, tenants in this case argue that a new landlord looking to renovate their apartments and raise their rents left them feeling compelled to move during a pandemic. They felt they never had a good opportunity to negotiate better terms that would have allowed them to stay. And now they feel like they're being shaken down by a wealthy individual for money owed from nearly two years ago. On the other hand, the landlord argues that she gave these tenants plenty of opportunities to stay or to move out and have their rental arrears forgiven. Offers that she also successfully made to other of the building's tenants. But these two renters in particular, she argues, chose instead to not pay what they owed and then moved out without her company getting fairly compensated for the services it provided. So yeah, she gave them the opportunity to move out and not, you know, basically not owe her anything, okay? She just wanted her building back so that she could fix it up. But they didn't do, they didn't take her offer. 
Now, the other tenants in the same building said, yes, we will do this. You know, we will move out if we can't pay and you can have your unit back and we won't owe you anything. And, you know, th that, there were no issues, but these two tenants decided not to do that. So they caused their own situation. And that's pretty bad right there. But now we're going to hear the ridiculous response from these tenants. Okay, the here, here's what they think, right? And... I think it's complete garbage. I think it's complete BS. But this goes into the mentality of these very entitled people who think that the government or someone else should pay all their bills and take care of them. But let's go. It was two years ago, Mendez Perez told the Independent about the rental debts he accrued while living at 264 Huntington Street. We, under, we don't under, understand why this situation is happening. Given the time that has passed and the economic hardships of the pandemic, he asked, why won't their former landlord just pardon the debt? Ramirez agreed. They wanted to renovate and increase the rents really, really high from around 1000 per month to 1400 per month. He said he and his former housemate, Mendez Perez, found it impossible to stay at those higher rents. He argued they should not be hounded now for debts that date back so long and that piled up during the early months of the pandemic. <laughs> So there, there you go, okay? The tenant's like, well, that, that was like two years ago. I mean, I, I shouldn't have to pay anything now. I mean, that was so long ago. I mean, you know, debts just disappear after like two years, right? No, no, okay? And that, that is so stupid that, I mean, I just have to call you out. You're, you're dumb, okay? That tenant is dumb as hell. Okay, if he thinks that debts should just disappear after two years, you owe this landlord money. You need to pay what you owe. That's what you agreed to when you had that lease. And if you had just communicated with this landlord and moved out when she asked you to, she wouldn't have even sued you. But now you're going to get sued in this small claims court and you're going to lose. You're going to lose and you're going to have that debt that you have to pay. I mean, may maybe she should send the creditors after you. Maybe she should, you know, get your wages garnished, but you know. I don't know what she's going to do, but whatever, you know, you are getting what you deserve at this point. But I'm going to skip down a little bit in this article and let's see what it says here. Okay, it says, and they, they go into explaining why the landlord took so long to you know, get, get all this, you know, two years later, right? And even uh, a year after they filed the initial case, right? And it says here that Dom disagreed with their takes on what happened and plans on continuing to prosecute both small claims cases. As for the timing of Wednesday's court hearings, Dom said via an email comment sent to the Independent, the initial small claims lawsuits were made at, that, at the time Mr. Ramirez and Mr. Mendez uh, Perez moved out of the building at the end of 2020. She added that she filed them with the court in May of 2021 because that's how long it took her company to find out where her former tenants had moved to. So yeah, it took the, her six months to figure out just where they moved to after they left, just so that she could get you know the paperwork served on them. Okay, and it says these lawsuits and hearings are coming up again now, not because of some new action on the part of myself or my attorney but simply because that's how long it took for them to get through the court system, she continued. So yeah, the court system is so backed up up there that it took over a year before it finally got heard. So they, you know, like I said, they caused this situation. It's not like two, it, you know, she wanted it to be two years before she tried to get her money back. No, the courts in New York are super backed up and she couldn't even find them because they didn't give her a forwarding address. You know, what, what a ridiculous, nonsensical situation this is. And I hope this landlord gets every single penny that she is owed to her.